On this episode of Star Trek Universe, Matt and I discuss where Strange New World Season 3 stands now that the sag after strike is over, as well as Lower Deck Season 5 teases from showrunner Mike McMahon, when we can expect to see Prodigy Season 1 show up on Netflix, and of course your feedback from Lower Decks 410, Old Friends, New Planets, right after these words from our mystery sponsors. Welcome to Star Trek Universe, the podcast where you get to listen in on two lifelong friends, sit and chat about, this week, Lower Decks. My name's Matthew Carroll. I am David C. Robertson. What's up, buddy? Uh, bad back, as always. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's I bad heard. It. That's terrible, man, I'm sorry. That's about it. Yeah, I'm used to it, I guess. <laughs> I know. I know, I know. Well, uh... Yeah, sorry. I, I'm running crazy late to this podcast, which I did not explain to you. We had a, we had to have contractors working on the house, build my mom an apartment, and uh, I think they, they were done with that. They got done enough for her to move in, uh, so that's exciting. She's in. She moved in down there, but there's still a bunch of little stuff to do, and uh, they're getting really build close. Her gun racks. Yeah, gotta you gotta get the gun racks. Um, oh. <laughs> but uh, they they got a bunch of like little finishing touches to do that were like the, the last like she needed to move in and they were taking a week vacation. They're all going on a cruise. The whole the whole team was going on a cruise that was doing the the, the renovation. And um, uh, so they, they were. I was like, man, I'd really like you guys to finish it this week. So so they like rushed and did all the like essential to live here things: the waterworks, the power works, you know, shit like that. Mm-hmm. And then it was like uh, there's a bunch of like adding in a grab bar next to the sink or adding in this or that, you know, the little things that like aren't essential for today, but, but are, but are getting done this week. So hopefully, hopefully it'll be completely done by the end of the week. And I'm really, really freaking excited. Awesome. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, so what's happening with you, bud? I don't know. No, yeah, you, I, said, you said bad back. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, 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 yeah. Rever- I, I, I double reverse unoed you on the what's going on. You did. <laughs> I hear there's news. Yeah, there is news. There is news. But that's not going on with me, but, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, <laughs> fine, I guess we can talk about Star Trek. Sorry, you, I thought it was asked and answered. You said bad back. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> my back has really bothered me. That's know, pretty much know, the end of the story. Well, that's what I mean. Let's get let's get uh, on to Star Trek so we don't uh, yeah. make you sit in your chair for too long. <laughs> sit in my chair. Sit in your podcasting chair. It's a torture device. <laughs> Why did I buy this torture device when I could I have just bought a nice cushy chair? I don't know, man. Choices we make. Choices we make. The uh, <laughs> the strike has ended. The this writer strike is over. We knew Woo-hoo! that for a while. SAG is now officially over as well, and they can get back to casting and auditions and all that bullshit. Um, now, the producing director, Chris Fisher, told Trek Movie that they had just been one day away from flying in the actors before SAG shut them down. Mm. And during the strike, Fisher and the producers in Toronto kept a rotating plan going so they could remain, quote, weeks away from being able to go into production once the strikes ended. And over the weekend, Fisher announced on Instagram that he's going back to Toronto for for work this week. And uh, it looks like all like all the all the other people are starting to uh, talk about it on social media about how they're heading back. Nice. People looking to sublet their apartments. People looking <laughs> for parking spaces in Toronto. It's exciting. It's, there's a buzz. A buzz, man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I feel a buzz, all right. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is according to the Directors Guild of Canada. Pre-production for Season 3 of Strange New Worlds has started. And uh, with production... Set on December 11th, running through July 2024. Cool. And uh, I don't know exactly what this means. Like, if it says here, if production on Strange New Worlds Season 3 starts on time in December, filming for one of the 10 episodes 
could be completed before the Christmas break with the other nine episodes filmed in the first half of 2024. For the first two seasons, there was around a 15-month gap from the start of production to the season premiere. If this pattern continued, we would expect season three to debut in early 2025. And this is the most likely scenario, but they could be moving quicker because the production team did say they were already building ARs, uh, the AR wall shots and a bunch of the VFX. Mm. So they actually might have a fair amount of the uh, post-production done. Right. They got rid of the a lot, uh, further in the previs or whatever. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so that's where we are on season three of that's Strange awesome. New Worlds. I mean, I, I say awesome. It, it sounds like it might be as much as a year before we get any uh, any Strange New Worlds, which is a bummer with uh, mm-hmm. it being 2025. But, you know, I'm excited that there will be new Star Trek. <laughs> I'm excited to be in general. Like, we've been... Um, I do, a, I do a show called Multiverse News, which I think I've mentioned on here, um, and we cover news, and like the second we started that show, I think it was like our second week of production on that podcast, they started, the, the writers and actor strike started, and it's just mm-hmm. like, suddenly no news can happen. Good thing we started a news show. Like, there's still plenty to cover, and a lot of it had re- to do with the writers and actor strikes and, like, what mm-hmm. they're fighting over and blah. But it's just sort of like, the the fun stuff of, like, this is coming, and that's coming, and this is announced. Yeah. And that just all stopped the second we started the show. So I'm really excited, uh, both for Star Trek and just, like, everything all the multiverse of properties we love yeah. uh i'm just really pumped that things can produce be produced again absolutely man i'm down i'm excited um you want hear about this lower decks stuff mike mcmahon is teasing a bunch of the lower deck stuff um cool he says uh season five mariner is much more joyful she's still mariner she's still chaotic she's still hilarious but she isn't weighed down uh, by the weight of not having spoken about Cedo. Mm. He says, Tendi will return. Tendi is not being written out of the show. This isn't a bad thing for Tendi. She is going to go and kick some ass. Tendi's been trying to figure out, is she Starfleet or is she the mistress of the winter constellations? And at the end of the episode, she's like, no, I'm Devana Tendi. I'm something new that exists in both. And my sister wants me to come back to Orion. Well, she might have bitten off a little more than she can chew. Mm-hmm. He says, there's some really, really fun, funny stuff for Talyn in season five. I don't want to give away uh, too much. How can I say this? Talyn's story in season five involves her and another character in an interesting way. And you see Talyn embrace science and Starfleet more than I think people anticipate. And he has a little bit about Ma'ach, the uh, lower decks, lower decker Klingon who rose to the rank of captain. He says, mm-hmm. Ma'ach is not on the same path as Talyn, but I love Klingons, and I love him, and you get more. This is not the end of him. Sweet. He says, we know season four took some serialized elements we had done before and kind of ramped them up across the whole season, but there is a little bit of serialization in season five, but not to the extent that you saw this season. This one hmm. was a special take. I don't know how I feel about that. I, You know, it's, it's, it's so interesting. Like, there's that is almost always a huge discussion when we're podcasting about any of these shows is like how they handle the amount of serialization versus uh, episodic storytelling. And it's just like, yeah, this is, I really liked this season. It felt like a really good balance for me. Like I feel like every episode had its own identity, but it all built towards something. Mm -hmm. Um, This was this, this very much used the burn notice model. (laughs) What what's the burn notice model? The burn burn notice model. (laughs) I love that show is, Every episode is its own thing, but it always starts and ends with like a little bitty nugget of the the overarching story. Sometimes the the, mm. cent, the center story has something to do with the overarching story, and kind of gets the, the 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 story of each episode sort of like moves closer and closer to the the, the main villain of the season or whatever. But there's mm-hmm. always some sort of like he's always like. I need to find out who's burned me. And it's like, he has some conversation at the beginning of the episode about who burned him. Then he goes and helps a stranger a la the Hulk. And then Mm -hmm. the end of the episode, he's like, I got another clue. And then the next episode starts with like, 
all right, I got this clue. It leads me to the next clue. And then he goes and helps a stranger for 42 minutes and then comes back with a 30 second tag about the next clue. And it's sort of like, Mm -hmm. it leads you through the story. And then it always ends up being a really good epic last two parter where he's like dealing with the actual story, the bigger story. But, uh, Every episode feels fulfilling because you got a little nice little story about some stranger uh, that he had to help. Yeah, Was it, like uh, <laughs> it's it's like the Hulk or Highway to Heaven. I was thinking Batman the Brave and the Bold because <laughs> they oh. did it in one season. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. I haven't, I haven't seen Batman the Brave and the Bold. You you've you've raved about it over the years. I, yeah, you yeah you should absolutely see it. I will. I will. It's really hard for me to get into uh, some animation in general. <clears throat> animation in general is hard for me to get into, but it's like certain ones I, I, I get into. And the ones I loved as a kid, like Batman the Animated Series, have like a special place in my heart, you know? But mm-hmm. it's hard for me to get into, like, for whatever reason, Brave and the Bold came out after I was like, I had kind of left that behind. But uh, I, I, I would like to see it. You've told me yeah. so many times how good it is. Yeah, I I probably I I don't know I was kind of toying with the idea of watching that show, and then I saw the last episode on YouTube, and I was like, I, I just saw like a clip accidentally, like it was like on a playlist or something, and I was like, what was that? That was crazy, and it was literally Paul Rubens as Batmite, um making parts of the sky go away and like get turned like to snow um like a tv screen Mm -hmm. and he was like that's right batman people are tuning out and i realized it was a piece of the final episode (laughs) where batman's like gotten bored with this version of batman and making it get canceled that's funny (laughs) uh I've, i've often told the story about uh mine and your experience with buffy and angel Mm-hmm. Where we had never really watched much Buffy and Angel, and then for some reason we both caught the puppet episode of Angel, which is in the you know twelfth twelfth produ- produced season of that mm-hmm. canon. It's like the mm-hmm. last season of that canon. We both watched the same episode and then decided to go back to the beginning and start from the beginning yep. and watch the entire thing. It's very weird, but like that's how it reminds me of it. Like especially Batmite being such a, a silly character, and then like it being in the final season. That's really funny. Yeah. Oh, uh, if it helps, uh, Batman the Brave and the Bold, Matt, there's an ep- there's a musical episode starring Neil Patrick Harris as the music meister. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Ooh, I, 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 I'm sorry to not stay on Star Trek, but I feel like this is very adjacent. When does, isn't it like this week that that uh, Doctor Who with Neil Patrick Harris and David Tennant drops? I don't know, but I'm not caught up, so I can't watch it yet. <laughs> I missed a lot of the Whitaker years, but like, or a year or something. Uh, but like, I might, I might, I might just jump in because it's David Tennant. I can see doing it. I'm not going to. I get that. I understand. So, what other news we got? Any other news? Uh, yeah. Uh, Star Trek Prodigy season one is officially coming to Netflix on Christmas Day. December 25th, 2023. That's what it is, y'all. And uh, we don't know when the second season is coming out. It will be 2024, but it's uh, close to being completed. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, I know they've been saying this coming, and then they're going to play season two after that, mm-hmm. right? That's cool. I'm, I'm excited for that, both for season two eventually to come, but also for it to be available. <laughs> And then mm-hmm. also because, uh, you know, m- introduce a new crop of fans to Star Trek. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, a new crap of fans. A crop of fans. <laughs> what do they call a group of Star Trek fans? Oh, yeah, a crap. <laughs> <laughs> no, what do they call a group of Star Trek fans? A murder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're uh, well, what we got next is feedback. You want Sweet. to feedback? Yeah, let's talk about feedback. This is for Lower Decks season finale. Yeah, 410. Well, actually, uh, the first one from Tim Castillo is for 409. And um, he says, uh, I want to write in every week, but you guys are so fast now. <laughs> yeah, 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 we're not now. 
Season's over. It takes us three weeks to get back with feedback. A slick, slippery, well-oiled machine. Yeah. <laughs> Good on you, boys. I digress. This episode blew me away. I teared up when Mariner talked about Cedo and then bringing back Nick Lacarno as the season villain is just amazing. There were further stories about Cedo outside of the show itself, so I wonder if they might bring her back also. They did. But that probably would have played stronger if she was revealed at the end of the episode along with or instead of Locarno. She went out a redeemed character and a hero. So it would be a bit of a betrayal to her character, whereas Locarno remained a heel. So this makes sense. Hmm. This may not be the funniest episode, but it was really good. There were still some good laugh lines. Even something just as small as Boimler complaining about having sticks in his boots. The B story <laughs> playing off of how conspicuous Starfleet make themselves going to underworld planets in their uniforms was great. Muds is a great inclusion, too, and holy crap, I laughed so much at the not a puppet. (laughs) 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 Also, perhaps it's just unavoidable at this point, but did you guys get some Star Wars vibes from the locations in this episode? Large building in a forest with a giant satellite dish, a hub of crime and villainy on a desert... Wasteland planet, and then the Klingon saying, I have a plan, kind of like Han Solo and Return of the Jedi. Okay, I'm reading too much into this. What can I say? I like the star things. <laughs> Be they treks, wars, gates, crafts. Star Kid was fun too, but I might not revisit that one. It probably hasn't aged well. <laughs> this planet is without honor. Tim Castillo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a particularly like a, good episode. Yeah, I, I feel like I had a bit of a Casey case in there. <laughs> this planet is without honor, Jim Castillo. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, that was a great episode, and uh, I yeah, I don't I don't know what else to say about it. I don't know about Star Kid either. Yeah, I don't know what Star Kid is. Did he like Star Girl? Wasn't that on Maybe. CW for a minute? Uh, y- yeah, it was. It was a good show. Yeah. I like Star Girl. Yeah. That yeah. was one of those, like, co produced by HBO, so it had an actual budget. Star Kid. Oh, I've seen this, uh, I've seen this poster, like, in a, uh, I think it's a, is it a movie? I guess it's a movie, probably. Anyway, yeah, cool. I also like the Star Things. Um, Star Wars more lately. Been enjoying it. Yeah. I just uh, I haven't gotten to it. I'm just mm. yeah. I I particularly enjoyed Ahsoka as it's as a weekly like watch. You know, like just the the, the conversation around it, like the 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 banter, the the people putting out memes. Like it was all just a lot of fun. It, it, same thing with Loki. Like I'm really pumped that Loki was so good. I, I feel like things are. I feel like we had a bit of a drought of really content. I was excited about, and like lately, I've been really excited about a lot of things. So it's been fun. Yeah, I haven't gotten to see season two of Loki yet. Mm. I think you'll love it. I still need to see uh, whatever all the other shit is. You just come over <laughs> here and watch Loki with me. No, It'll be fun. I gotta watch a uh, Secret Invasion. And- no, you don't. You know, watch uh, <laughs> Wakanda Forever and the Ant Man and the Wasp uh, Three. And... You do need to watch Wakanda Forever. No, you don't. I'm sorry. I was thinking about for uh, Secret Invasion. But I I do know what the uh, I haven't seen the Marvels yet, but I know what the post uh, the the Stinger is, and I'm really excited about it. Yeah, Stinger Stinger <laughs> is very exciting. Um, we won't we won't spoil it here because this is definitely this is definitely tangential and a big spoiler in a movie that yeah. just came out. But um, but yeah. The big, big good stinger for, uh, I, I think like, it's so funny. Everybody's been talking about the, the fall of Marvel and it's still like having bad, like run in the theaters with the Marvels or whatever. Yeah. But like, I think in that, as I predicted. All right. <laughs> I've been saying, for, I've been saying for years, the critics would unjustly turn against Marvel. Oh, well, I, I don't think it's unjust. <laughs> I really don't. Like, I think they've had a bad, a bad run. Um, oh, that's because you're like them. <laughs> whatever i'm a huge fan and like a huge uh, <laughs> proponent of marvel but i think they like it's not even that they've you had think a you bad are. run 
It's that they <laughs> like like they've had a pretty good run of content. It's just they've yeah. started they've lost the plot on the leading from one story to the next in while ma- they've lost the, the thing exactly what we were talking about with this show with Lord X. They've lost the plot on what when this thing should be episodic and how much the balance between episodic and serialized it's like uh, it's so mm-hmm. important to like everything and marvel it's hugely important too and it's like sometimes they just zig when they should zag on that stuff yeah i i always think they've been weak on that always hmm i don't because they've always left a movie in a certain place and you're like oh that's that's going to be interesting to to explore and then they pick up and that's been resolved off screen. Oh, see, to me, that's and that's something different. But yes, that is that is that is, has been a problem. That's only been a problem for a couple of things, though. There's only like a couple of issues that were that were done that way. I feel like, but it is. I mean, you're getting these glimpses of people's lives like two or three years apart a lot of times. Yeah. Um, particularly Tony's story feels that way. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely that. But one. That, that's the one that I think is, is most stand out. Um, but but what I'm talking about is like the story itself either not feeling like a full meal if as it were mm-hmm. like it's not self contained enough so it just feels like an appetizer for the bigger story um the early first three phases sometimes they feel so much like a meal that it's frustrating like <laughs> like you go to see i don't know Ant-Man and you're like Ant-Man and the Wasp and you're like it's right before Thanos they're really going to get into some Thanosy things and then it's like they barely get into Thanos. You know what I mean? Like, like it's barely, yeah. they barely talk about it. It's not in the actual body of the movie, that sort of thing where it's like, I'm almost, I was almost frustrated at where I think they've gone too far in the other direction now, but I actually think it's a better, much stronger move to make each property its own story. It's the burn notice model, man. I'm telling you, it's the burn notice model. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the thing everybody was complaining about when they did it, like with agents of shield and Netflix, the Netflix shows, like everyone was like, it has nothing to do with Thanos, <laughs> right? Totally. Well, that's different because that's like the can. That's a break in canon, which is a whole different issue. But like, um, yeah, I, I do think that, like, in some I, ways, yeah. I've been I've been a uh, um, advocating the fact that like Marvel seems to be taking the notes that like Phase Four and Five uh, have not been hitting like they wanted them to, and I think some of that is them not doing that burn notice thing right. <laughs> like mm-hmm. they're either, and they, they break it in both directions. Like it's not like one thing or the other. Sometimes something is so connected that you can't follow it unless you've seen everything else. And sometimes something is not so in unconnected that it feels like unimportant. So it's like they, they did a really good job of balancing that in the first three phases. And then it seems, feels like for phase, phase four and five. And I think part of it is just like, they're putting out so much content that there's like, you see four series uh, uh, four four seasons of shows before something gets called back to. So you're just like, yeah. When is, when are they going to talk about those rings at the end of Shang Chi? When's it going to happen? And it's like, uh, we're like, we're what seven, eight, nine properties later, and it seemed like such a big thing, and it still hasn't happened. <laughs> you know, and it's been like what seven or eight movies since you know that freaking giant person was birthed out of the Earth in Eternals, and they ha- they've never brought it up again. Yeah, but that's a little less. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, they have brought it up once, but uh, uh, it was in She-Hulk. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I loved Eternals, and I hate the shade that has gotten. Oh really? The, just, I hate how much they just have, have ignored it completely. Hmm. Like, well, see, that's the thing though. That's exactly the problem. When something happens now in Marvel, and you don't hear mm-hmm. about it for five movies, I don't know if it's because they're ignoring it or it's because they're in such production clip that it's like. I don't know when they plan to bring it up again. It may not be that they're ignoring it. Mm-hmm. It's just like, it's only been a year and a half or something, but it's like, we've seen so many properties that it feels like that should have been brought up by now. You know what I mean? But it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Also, there's just so much I can't keep up. And I feel like I am a general audience member almost with Marvel now at this point. Exactly. Like, yeah. They they ran off some of their diehards. I don't know what is okay to watch out of order or what. I don't. And I feel yeah. like I'm going to miss something, so I just don't watch any of it. Right. I understand. I understand. And I, I do think that, like, the, the strength of the old days of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Defenders <clears throat> was if you were a big fan, you could fall in love with S.H.I.E.L.D. and Defenders. But if you were a casual, you didn't think that Daredevil was going to give something 
like it was going to show you something that you couldn't like follow the next Avengers movie, you know? So if you mm-hmm. didn't watch Daredevil, you didn't feel like you couldn't go see Endgame, you know? Um, he might show up in Endgame. Who knows? We all wanted it, but like it was, it wasn't hmm. a thing where like if it, if he showed up, you'd feel like, oh, I bet I guess I should have watched that freaking Defender show. You know what I mean? Um, but like, yeah, now it feels everything is so connected and happening so fast that it's hard to keep the size audience they had. Yep. It's tough. It is tough. It's a tough uh, nut to crack. It's a tough nut to bust. Indeed. <laughs> If, you, if you're having a trouble, go to bluechew.com slash Star Trek Universe. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. We don't have that. <laughs> no. No. All right. John Plays What says, uh, in your discussions last week, I got to thinking of what's the funniest way they could make a Tom Paris, Nick Locarno joke. And I hmm. honestly want them to break canon or make them and or make some new canon. My head cannon, when Tom Paris was a baby, he and his family went on a trip and at some point used a transporter. During one of their transports, a slight surge overload uh, overloads Tom Paris's pattern in the buffer, but no one realizes until they are long gone. His family leaves, knowing nothing. But the transporter tech tries to solve, the, solve and resolve the issue, and a transporter clone of Tom materializes and is adopted by the Locarno family. Hence, Nick Locarno exists... And looks and sounds and acts exactly like Tom Paris. And just so happens to also be a juvenile delinquent. Hmm. I know they won't do it, but I think it would be a hilarious way to, to explain the resemblance. Definitely. Someone pointed out in an episode of Voyager, uh, Admiral Paris had um, a picture of quote-unquote Tom as a cadet on his desk and it's just a screenshot of Nick Locarno from, from the first duty. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. And I love, I love the idea because specifically because like when I was graduating from elementary school, my grandfather took video of another kid graduating and thought it was me. <laughs> so I love the idea that like, you know, old Admiral Paris just has like a picture of Nick Locarno on his desk thinking it's Tom. That's really funny. I really love that 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 joke. Yeah. That's awesome. Um Tim Castillo writes in about four ten now. Tim says maybe this one will make it. Well they both did, buddy. <laughs> hey guys, Thursdays have been great days lately. Or at least a little better than usual. So was Locarno really dead? Maybe there will be some Locarno lizards on the planet. They could have the same face and everything. Pretty excited to see Mistress of the Winter Constellation next season. Devana seems to be embracing it. I know it's animated, but hey, they did great. They did a great job giving her a killer expression as she walked out of frame. The way they left her at the end almost makes me wonder if there's plans for a spinoff with Tindy and the Orions, or just set up for next season. Dude, I would take a spinoff with Tindy. Oh yeah. Let's make a live action, though. Ooh. I would be very <laughs> down. Yeah. I like how they replaced her in the group. Not only does Talyn have science chops, she's got an apostrophe in the name in the same place in her name. <laughs> That's funny. The pan to the stars to credit was a fun way to end the episode. I gotta say, there was some f- fantastic camera work in this episode and throughout the season. It doesn't get talked about much with animation, but the framing and composition of many shots have been truly cinematic. I love it. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Getting Cedo and Wes in the flashback was good fun. I love that this show can bounce around the universe like this. Always down for seeing characters from other shows and posts of the canon, and getting the original actors back was great. I don't know if you guys saw it when it came out or have since, but one of my favorite animated movies as a kid was Titan A.E., this episode had seen straight from that movie. The ice belt surrounding a planet was in that movie. Same design. I thought it was a, an awesome callback, especially since at the end they made a new planet. I just got really big Titan AE vibes from the episode, and it seemed to be on purpose, but who knows. Oddly enough, there's a shot in that movie that looks a lot like the Badlands that the Maquis would hide in, and where Voyager got lost. I'm not saying it's a snake eating its own tail, but art is like that sometimes. 
I momentarily thought the trinary shield was Q, and I couldn't imagine where the episode was going until I immediately realized it was just a big shield. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, love the episode, love the season, love your podcast, and I'm enjoying the TOS episodes too. Ah, oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Now, where the heck is Wes and not Data's daughter? The ready room almost seems like a kind of purgatory for Will Wheaton. Write him a good part, now that you can, is what I say. They can't give us that scene from Picard and not pay it off somehow. They've certainly never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out for shoulder blades, Tim Castillo. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yeah, I thought about the Q shield from Encounter at Farpoint as well when I saw that. Uh, Titan yeah. AE, I never actually watched, which is surprising because it was written by Joss Whedon. Oh, yeah. I, I remember thinking about watching that and never getting around to it, and that might, that must be why. Yeah, then that was, yeah, it was a Whedon thing. Hmm, I may have to check it out. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, I really want them to do a deep dive on the supervisors, on Wesley Crusher. I want to see, like, ba I basically want to see Wesley Crusher as Kang. Like hmm. <laughs> talking about the you know, the like the timelines branching off mm -hmm. and showing different versions oh, of awesome. what used to be and shit like that. That'd be like awesome. This. It's so it's tough because like the multiverse is I know this is well trodden criticism, but the multiverse is kind of in everything now. <laughs> it's almost like the multiverse is its own genre of fiction, which I mean I guess mm. I guess it is in a way. It's always been a part of every, like Star Trek and oh for sure DC and Marvel for a long time oh for sure um, but it, it just feels like some things are getting so multiversal obviously with Marvel doing it with uh, getting it more in DC with um with with the movies um, getting it uh, with Flash particularly um, and uh, and and getting it uh, in just like everything I was watching uh, Rick and Morty this morning <laughs> mm -hmm. and I mean obviously that show's been about the multiverse from the beginning, but like the way they use the multiverse feels like the, the kinds of jokes they make about it feels so self-critical of the genre of multiverse storytelling in a way. Like the there's, there's a point where you've got shows like the boys and Rick and Morty. They're sort of taking the piss out of, the things we love mm -hmm. where it almost feels like those things need to adapt and change because they've, they've been done to death to the point that like they're parodyable. You know what I mean? Like they've been done to the death to the point that they can be so infinitely parodied. And it, it almost feels like shows like Rick and Morty and the boys um, feel and, and uh, invincible feel like this sort of, almost cr not really criticism, but like a loving send up of a genre that is almost feels like it's been explored to death and now it needs to like evolve so that it can get the next surprising kind of media out of it. And I think things like, mm -hmm. um, everything ever at once is like an advancement of that type of storytelling. Um, I'm not sure it is. I feel like, it's, I feel like that movie specifically was almost like, an indie version of the multiverse, you know, oh, for sure like, it was. Yeah. Like it's like, it's like an indie movie. I mean, it is an indie movie, but it feels like an indie movie. Like, like the quirky ideas almost, you know, yeah, like it's, yeah, yeah. it's, there's not like that uh, predictable plot structure necessarily. It's just sort of, well, I would contend that that's where a lot of the innovation happens in, yeah, in, maybe. The, in these types of stories. Like a lot of times it's the, you get those sorts of like up and coming universes that sort of like tell a story that's so different that it makes everyone think about the multiverse in a different way or a different way of using it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and then that, and then that inspires a bunch of people working within these franchises to sort of like, well, what can we do? That's kind of like, like taking this like new creative upstart energy of the indie film and like put it into our stuff, you know? Yeah. I also feel like that one was like, <laughs> I feel like most people are, who are making mainstream multiverse movies are going to look at that and go like, that was really cool. That was also really complicated. Sure. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're probably right. <laughs> Kang has a device. 
<laughs> I don't know. I, th- I think of it like uh, you, you got a story about vengeance, you know, and it's yeah. like uh, uh, y- y- you've had stories about vengeance forever, and then you get Memento, mm-hmm. a story about vengeance, and it's like that's the indie film version that that director goes on to produce Batman 10 years later. You know what I mean? Like, and it's sort yeah. of like, and that infuses new life and creativity and a version of Batman that hasn't existed. And the Joker that we all love from those movies and all that stuff, like comes from the mind of someone making this sort of vengeance tale on a smaller level. You know, it's sort of the same sort of thing where like, who knows what the Daniels or someone inspired by them will do in 10 yeah. years in one of these franchises. And that's kind of what like gets me excited about this stuff. You know, that's why mm-hmm. like, and then Ten years later, the Dark Knight trilogy, while it's still great, it feels like yeah. a lot of stuff. It's it's launched a thousand things. Like a, th- a lot of stuff has used that gritty, realistic tone, and now it's like, what's the next thing that's going to hit? Is it the sort of like quirky, you, you multiversal stuff of everything over at once? Will that be something that's adopted by a thousand franchises, or will it be? Yeah. I just I love that kind of like. Um, I guess like overarching tale of what inspires what and how these stories talk to each other. I just think it's so cool. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. What's next. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. I talked us into a (laughs) cul-de-sac. I'm just sitting here going, I don't like Memento. I don't like the Dark Knight trilogy. I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I think the... I I despise portions of the Dark Knight trilogy, but certain parts of it are <laughs> are amazing. And some of those parts, I think that Aaron Eckhart and uh, Heath Ledger as the villains in the second one are, like, top-notch. And the origin oh, story... Yeah, yeah. The way they tell the origin story of Batman and Batman Begins is awesome to see on live action. You know, I love that. Yeah. If I could just take like a little potato peeler and just like pull out Heath Ledger and Michael Caine mm. from those movies and put them in three better movies. Yeah. I would. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I do. But I, I guess I, I probably maybe I like those movies better than you do. I don't know. I, I, I hate the yeah. third one. Hate it with a passion. But Me like, too. Uh, but I and, and I and I know you've got a lot of problems with the way Batman is portrayed, like him giving up and all that stuff. And I know we've talked about all this before. I'm sure. I mean, somewhere. even just putting it aside, there's just so many plot holes in the third one. Like it just makes no sense. It makes no oh, the sense. third one is trash. Nolan is a planner. He really plans out his movies, and I think he had a really good plan for the third one. Probably. I don't know what he had. I'm guessing he had a really good... I, I've been saying this for years, but I think he had a really good plan. Then Heath Ledger's death screwed up his plan, and his backup plan was terrible. I don't know that he had a great plan, because I know his plan, as he said, was always to have Bruce Wayne overcome the crutch of being Batman. Sure, <laughs> sure. So, and then, like, when you take that and you start, like backtracking it through uh, Dark Knight, it kind of ruins Dark Knight for me because of, like, how he's just being a dick, like a total cock-blocking dick, trying to, like, get Rachel to leave her fiancé and shit. Like, dude, you're an asshole. Like, you stopped organized crime, so now you think she's gonna run away with you? Like, your parents didn't die from organized crime, Bruce. It was a mugger in the street, you piece of shit. (laughs) Sure. I don't know. I just... uh, I, don't know. I have my issues. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I hear you. Anyway. And I, that's not, yeah, like that's neither here nor there. I think those movies, where they advance the plot is not the plot. <laughs> like mm. the advancements that Nolan made to that, that canon are not like plot centric. They are stylistic and they are, um, they gave, I mean, you know, I think what, I think the first Oscars ever won by like a comic book movie are those movies. Um, I don't follow Oscars because I think it's a sham. Everybody sure. pays to get nominated, and I just don't give a shit. So. Sure, but it's what makes. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's fine, but like it's that makes really great actors be willing to do movies that they wouldn't have been d- willing to do five years ago. Mm-hmm. But like I'm not putting on tights. <clears throat> oh wait, who put on tights? Oh, maybe I'll do that. You know, Nolan advanced the storyline, uh, advanced the genre in that he got these like better actors, like better quality actors willing to put in 
their best work, not just like get really good actors for a paycheck to put on some tights and uh, scream like whatever Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> but but you know what? He also like set DC fans back in a way that like he brainwashed so many DC fans into thinking that DC has to be dark, gritty, and grounded. And I'm like, sure. if you look at a single comic book, you know that DC is anything but. In so many ways. Right. <laughs> like, I, I'm with you. Like, there's obviously, like, there's... When something is as big as those movies were, it causes ripples that are positive. It takes the positives and the negatives and reproduces them over all the content. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we, we got more feedback? <laughs> uh, yeah, we do. We have one more, and uh, let me just say that I am totally open to a Star Trek multiverse. More of that. I want to see more. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely interested. I love the multiverse. I like the multiverse a lot. The one with Jet Li is one of my favorite movies. Like Yeah. Oh, it's great. <laughs> very, very fond memories of that movie. Um, The thing that when it becomes so expansive to the point that none of the story, that, that some of the stories are just there to serve other stories, I think it starts to become kind of problematic, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, my Rick and Morty uh, discussion earlier, one of the things that's going on is like Rick is chasing whatever, someone in the multiverse, and it's just like... Rick Prime, yeah. Yeah. And so there, there was an episode I just watched, and I won't spoil the whole episode or anything, but like he basically just starts bringing forward like multiple, multiple versions of Rick and just murdering them over and over and over, just like Rick, 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 Rick. He's killing Ricks like they're nothing. Some mm -hmm. are robot Ricks, some are real Ricks that are whatever. Like just Rick, 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 Rick. It's just like it starts to be, and it, it is a joke. But like I think that same sort of thing that makes that a joke is something that is real in storytelling when you're like, okay, we've seen a thousand versions of this character. Now maybe none of them matter. You know what I mean? And like, so I really like yeah. the way that Star Trek has done the multiverse in the past where like we get specific instances of the multiverse like the Mirror Universe. Um, and, and of course we've had, we've seen others, especially with time travel. Um, and uh, it's just, we saw that Worf episode where he keeps coming home from the... Uh, parallels. Parallels. Yeah. Uh, and so, so like coming off the tournament. Um, so yeah. we've seen little instances of it, but like, I feel like when you get to the point where you're just like opening, I I'd like to see them have touch points with other multiverses like the mirror universe, maybe explore a few more. I don't really want to see like mm -hmm. the way you, the, it, it get to that Rick and Morty point where you're like, well, there's a thousand Jane ways and they all make different decisions, you know? And it's like, okay. I, then it starts to feel like there's no weight to any of the decisions, you know? Well, I mean, that kind of thing is perfect for Rick and Morty. Exactly. I don't want to see, like, you know, Timothy Chalamet running around as Tony Stark, you know, necessarily. Yeah. I mean, actually, actually, I said it. And yeah, it now I really I want like it. it now. I actually think he might I, be. I kind of like it. Yeah. He might be a great Iron Man, like a like an alternate <laughs> Iron Man. I think, like, I don't really like Timothy Chalamet that much, but, like, you say that, and I'm immediately on board. Like, a young Iron it Man. It sounded great. It sounds awesome. Internally, I was just like, but I don't want to see that. And then I said it, and it, like, it hit my ears, and I was like, oh, God, that sounds great. Yeah, no, that's a great casting. <laughs> I honestly think, like, he has the same sort of... Uh, yeah. frenetic energy and the same sort of like uh, good ability to sort of like say aside comments and like be a snide while also being heartfelt. Like he's a great Tony Stark option. Like I really think Tony Stark, like right now, like do it right now, make him one of the like yeah. multiversal Tony Starks. Who's like, uh, still young and his like father isn't dead or something. There's still a Howard Stark around and see him like do a just totally different thing. You know, like it could be yeah. really fun. Come on, Marvel. Iron Man into the Iron Verse. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude. I would be down with that. What's the lesson of Iron Man? Like, you got the lesson of Spider Man is like, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and I, in the end, all Marvel is kind of that same lesson. But, like, I feel like Iron Man's lesson would be much more selfish and self serving and, like, yeah. kind of uh, cheeky, I guess. Have a, have a drink, make cool shit. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> have a drink make cool shit save the world it's what we do um <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> keep your creations close to your heart nice nice pretty good Ah. <laughs> uh -huh. respect the arc Ooh, you gotta respect the arc Get, dude 
Go watch Loki season two. Don't watch anything else. Just jump to it. It doesn't matter. Nothing, uh, nothing else you've missed. I, and I'm t- I tell you this as someone who's seen it all and talked about it all for hours <laughs> on end. Uh huh. All the things you missed are worth seeing, but nothing you missed will touch Loki season two. Okay. Like you can you can just jump to it, and it's worth jumping to, and you're gonna get things spoiled, and it's just it's worth it. Yeah, I did watch Guardians Volume 3 out of order, and I feel dirty. <laughs> oh, man, I get that. I do. I, I mean, I'm right there with you. I've watched everything in order, too. Yeah. Um, ooh, man. See, this is where it comes. DC, Marvel, Star Trek. Me and you love Star Trek, and you love DC, yeah. and I love Marvel. Like, we both love each, but, like, those are the things we focus on in our podcasts and stuff. Well, you know, I focus on DC because you started the Marvel cast. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, I want to do a podcast. I've been, I had been wanting to do one for like two or three years before you started doing Marvel. Mm-hmm. But I did, I do like DC more. Well, if you recall, I did beg you to start the Marvel one with me for like a year, yeah. and then when uh, yeah, when Guardians dropped, I was like, well, screw you, Dave. I'm doing my own. <laughs> Yeah, you did, but uh, rightly so. I think I was like, I am not well versed enough in Marvel mm. to add much. Mm. Yeah, I just never had that problem. I don't think. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't feel like I would have served it. And you know, maybe, maybe you're right. You know, because you don't know anything. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know nothing. Uh, <laughs> just get out there and talk about the stuff I like. And the, the, the thing that that's the thing that made our show Mar- MCU cast. Uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. Check it out, guys. Um, that's the thing that made that gross. show its own thing. Is like we aren't. Well, Jeff is more of a comics fan than me, but he's not that deep on them either. And we just make it clear that like we are a show that is focused on what comes out in the movies, and we're going to talk about what has happened in these movies and how they connect. That's what we're talking about. Like we're not trying to tell you the perfect comics background. And sometimes people write in and we read their feedback about the comics <laughs> background, but it's like. This is what we're talking about. I'm the same way with Star Trek. Like I love Star Trek. Yeah, but I'm not as what nearly as well versed as you. Yeah, I'm sick. I know, and I'm. I know people are way more well versed than I am. Right. Totally. Those people are nerds. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like that thing about it. when is someone too rich? It's like anyone richer than you. <laughs> that old that old, that old joke of like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's just greedy. He's got three dollars more than me, uh, and then it's like, who's who's nerdy? Anyone nerdier than me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, those guys are losers. They've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Stu Little <laughs> as our last piece of feedback. Stu titled Livic Part Two. <laughs> he says, uh, "Hello." Stupid obstructive admirals and their dumb taking the bigger picture into account and trying not to escalate a crisis into an interstellar war. <laughs> yeah, that was like, I do think that like, um, it's funny and it's lower decks and that's the point, but like she should absolutely be court-martialed for what she did. <laughs> like just, oh, yeah. just because the admirals are happy with her because it turned out well, like, no, that's, that's how, that's how Kirk became the monster that he was. um i think it's it would be it's funny if like somewhere on lower decks like a version of like cancel culture happened with the federation where if like like a captain like too many captains were breaking the rules but saving the entire galaxy and starfleet demoted them for breaking the rules and then people were trying to like there was like an uproar mm-hmm. online and like canceling of Starfleet. So they're like, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> if, if you save the galaxy, we'll give you a pass there's, on the rules. There's a, there's a, like a survey or a petition online to get uh mayor's mom or job back. <laughs> yeah. I can, I could not think of her name right now. Carol. Oh, Carol. Carol Freeman. I see. I always think, well, the first thing I think is Robin, because that's who she played on, uh, Don Wells played on, uh, Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Mm. Uh, and then I go, no, Jaleesa, nope, that's who she played on A Different World. Mm. <laughs> 
I've got like four or five different names for her that pop into my head before I get to Carol Freeman, including the uh, Irish girlfriend of Andy Richter on Andy Richter Controls the Universe. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> She's like, yes, I'm Irish. He's like, you're Irish? It's <laughs> 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 um, a great show. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go back to Stu. Stu says, Nick says they're an unaligned fleet, but doesn't being together make them aligned? Yes, I think so. I think they're just hanging out because the minute that he tried to give them orders, they got mad. (laughs) Yeah, well, they're unaligned uh, to any previously known faction. So it's it's like a fleet that they Mm -hmm. can't, they're not connected to a government. And clearly, clearly they're not a government themselves. Yeah, and then they're they're the first fleet like this. Mm-hmm. The Marquis. Despite whether or not the Marquis want to have a word. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I do, I do love that, and I'm not sure we said that. We talked about that on the show. I do love that Nick Lacarno tried to start his own Marquis, essentially. Yeah, after and Tom, Tom Paris, Paris betrayed them to the Marquis. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty great. Um. Stu says, quote, I will be damned if I wait for politicians to decide her fate. Okay. My thesis on whenever a TV show does this sort of thing, because I rail on going rogue plots a lot. You either believe in democracy or you don't. I understand the feeling that exceptions can be made in desperate times, etc. But the fact that this seems to always be the default, the characters doing this shit are rarely depicted as wrong is getting really tiring and worrisome a bit in terms of message, especially coming in Star Trek, where a big central theme is people coming together and working out a problem in unity, constantly having characters say screw that and doing what they want because it's easier and more exciting to write it to write it like that seems to fundamentally go against that. And I know in real life, politicians can fuck things up and complicate things, but this isn't real life. It doesn't have to keep being anag- uh, uh, sorry, analogous. It could instead be aspirational by showing how the system is supposed to work instead of doing another I love the Federation, uh, too bad it sucks balls, so I have to behave in an unfederation-y way mm-hmm. thing like this. Thesis over. Note, I originally had a whole bit in this where I talked about Ahsoka doing a similarly annoying obstructive politician thing, which I thought was deeply flawed, but I realized some listeners might not have seen it, uh, seen that yet, so I didn't want to spoil it. Uh, don't worry, we just talked about uh, DC and, and, and Star- yeah, this, and Marvel for This particular for an episode hour. has been a very travel in the multiverse, as we, we can Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Um... No, I kind of go. I, um, I'm, I'm down with it. Um, Here's the thing: I, I agree with him. I think it's a dangerous precedent, and it's like a dangerous thing to teach people that like you should always go against the group. But I think there's a value to doing think plots like this. But I do think removing all punishment kind of ruins it like i actually think it would have been Mm -hmm. more powerful and more um more powerful from both directions if carol freeman goes completely or kirk or whoever goes completely rogue and like they uh they may save the galaxy or they may save someone there that's important to them but then they're punished for it because that's still that's still wrong and it's still and they and them as the uh valiant hero is supposed to say and did, I think she did say this. Didn't she come and say, I'll, I'll accept any punishment that's given to me or whatever? Yeah. I think that's how the episode ended, which I think is the right thing. Like, I think that's what should happen. I, sh- I accept the punishment. And then she should end up, you know, you're in jail for two years or whatever. You, like, you mutinied for all intents and purposes. But that's the thing about mm-hmm. Star Trek. There is some sort of rules in Starfleet that seem to be the captain has some choice in the matter of, of what rules to follow and what not to. They've talked a lot about that over the years. Like sometimes you're the boots on the ground and you have to make a decision that the up guys upstairs don't like, but like disregarding a direct order and endangering everyone is, is something that should be punished by society. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> we see it from Carol's perspective, and we see that she did the right thing in the end, and she saved everyone. So it's really hard for us to buy as a uh, 
I, I think that generally if you want to be a hero who thinks they should go rogue against the system, you should be willing to accept the punishment. And I don't think it would be wrong for the system to punish you anyway, even if the, yeah. even if the results are good. There is a through line in all of Star Trek going dating back to the original series that bureaucracies become top heavy and wind up not being idealistic. Yeah. It happens over and over and over. And sometimes they're like, this doesn't look good. Don't do it. And then Kirk's like, or whoever, whatever captain is on, is on the ground going, uh, no, this is actually way, way different than you think it is. And we got to stop it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you look at, uh, you know, uh, Kirk, Going to running to get Spock on in on on Genesis in Star Trek sure, Three, yeah. but then on the way back, yeah, he saved the world. <laughs> cool, and they did punish him. Yeah, they did. Which I was gonna I was gonna bring up. It's like a it, that's a really good example of them like punishing him, but in a way that like pleases the fans in a huge way. You'll demote you. Admiral Kirk, you're now back to being the role you always wanted. <laughs> yeah. And like uh, it was very clear that they knew that's exactly yeah. what he wanted exactly. to. Like he's like this is this is behavior unbefitting an admiral. Guess we'll have to make you a captain, you yeah. know. Uh, <laughs> um and also like I think I I am going to go even further and say Kirk is maybe to blame for the way the Federation treats these law breaking captains now hmm, that maybe. they're just like, why would you do this? That we told you not to do it. Well, I don't know. needs of the many. And it also seemed like it made sense. Okay. Right. I like that. <laughs> you got a real Kirk thing about you, boy. Right. Well, that's where courts should come in handy. Like this, this is another season that should end with Carol in handcuffs. But like, I do think that you, you then you go through with the trial and you make that you make the case in front of like you know a jury of your peers and all that stuff. You know, you don't just have the eh, politics seems to be swaying your way. We're gonna let you off with a with a with a warning or whatever. You know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I, I feel like the fans would complain that it was a really boring show, but I really, really want to see just, like, I want, like, an Aaron Sorkin inner workings of Starfleet. Oh, yeah, me too. I would love it. I would love show. it. Love it. I, I, uh, I also, I, I'd love to see that, but I understand that's not the show they're making, but they could just have a, um, like, like they could have a line at the end of this, like, well... When you get back to space dock, the admirals are going to have a talk with you. And then the next season could start with like, you know, a, an offhanded line about how they, uh, they were, they were slapped on the wrist because they saved everyone, but they're on thin ice or something, you know, like that, like this sort of like, yeah. uh, it, it just like, at least there's some sort of consequences because you did a thing you knew was rogue. You made a decision against the collective. You you don't get to make a decision for everybody. Like I think that's a. I, I basically I agree with Stu, but I just think there's like ways to yeah. handle it that are a little more uh, depth or whatever. Yeah, I agree ish with Stu. <laughs> I I do think that there's got to be, and it would be super interesting. I know I said it somewhat jokingly, uh, referring to it as like future cancel culture or something, but. When you consider like all of the different, like think about all the the ways, all the different planets would, anyway, re Stu continues. would report any of this kind of news. When you think about like, there's got to be some sort of like subspace internet or something. Like my god, like the PR that like like it just like the the Federation in general would have to worry about like people are now like pulling back their applications. They don't want to be a part of it because they said that, you know, we demoted this captain yeah. for doing the right thing. Like it has got to be like a terrible burden. Mm -hmm. It's like, they're like, Oh, like these activist captains doing their job, do it, doing like yeah. going overstepping their authority. Look at this asshole went over here to this planet Killed their alien overlord. <laughs> Those people chose that alien overlord. It's right there in the name, overlord. In fact, turns out it was a robot that they built over 300 years before. <laughs> P. 
people have the right to live under an authoritarian puppet <laughs> that they created. <laughs> Cultural differences. <laughs> My comment on the chosen champion for barter by combat? No comment. <laughs> he hates Miggly Mo. <laughs> Billups looking ready to punch a woman for an opinion he disagrees with. He's went from intentionally celibate to possibly incel in a really short time. <laughs> uh, yeah. This Cerritos side of the story is fun, but they feel a little bit relaxed, considering, for all they know, Mariner could be dead already. <laughs> That's why they were so relaxed. <laughs> they were like, finally. Aww. Freeman was the only Freeman was the only one who wanted to save her. <laughs> it was a mother's love. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate them not doing the what's my catchphrase thing with Boimler as acting captain. Me too, man. I didn't even think about that, but you're right. Mm-hmm. You're they right. definitely could have. Stu says, I don't know about the depiction of Nick's ruthlessness when first duty ended with him taking full responsibility for the incident to spare the other squadron members from expulsion. I think there's enough there for him to have been talked down instead of killed like that. Eh, maybe. Hmm. He seems like he's gone off the rails, though, honestly. Yeah. Of course, there's no consequences for Freeman doing this. I know she got relieved of command once before due to false charges, but what if they had just replaced her with a different captain to create a new dynamic for the start of the next season until they got they get her back? Hell, they could have also heavily demoted her and made her the same rank as Mariner for a while. That could be fun. Uh, even Tindy's departure felt underreacted to. Hmm. Or, or they could have like made her... M- they could have, uh, right as Mariner has decided she's fully Starfleet, you know, she's like, I'm committing to the bit. I'm going to be Starfleet. Um, even though I'm a little, uh, little, like I, I have my own thoughts and blah, blah, blah. She's going to like a little more like ready to ascend the ranks in Starfleet. Her mom gets kicked out of Starfleet and has no. to be like, goes and does something different. And now you've got this like mom who is always like trying to, keep her in line is now out like living outside Starfleet, whatever, running around with ar- archaeologists or whatever. <laughs> her mom's like, what was the name of that uh that lady you were running around with? That sounded fun. <laughs> <laughs> She's <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Like she, she she could be like out with whatever rogue band. She could get involved with like seven of nine and those those forces or whatever. <laughs> the Fenris Rangers. Which isn't around yeah. yet, uh, I don't believe. I don't know. I think this is before Fitness Rangers. I'm pretty sure. Uh. Anyway, yeah, I, I would be down with that too. Uh, Stu says, speaking of Tendi, the mood of that final moment felt weirdly ominous. I was even sort of going, wait, are they going to reveal she was a deep cover spy for the Orions the whole time? That would be a twist. Uh, if you've made it this episode, Stu, you know that is not what's going to happen. <laughs> Because Mike McMahon just said she's she's just realizing she's yeah, Devon attendee. I, I meant to say this when we talked about the Mike McMahon quotes. I really kind of hated those quotes because they do like sort of tell us – like I liked the ambiguity of her leaving. Um, and it lets mm-hmm. us for the next you know year or whatever speculate about like what's going to happen in, the, in a season five and what where is mm-hmm. she? Is she going to decide to be the mistress? Is she going to come back? Is she going to find something in between? And he sort of like answered that. And I, I just generally don't like when – um, creators come out and tell me how how the next season's going to shape up <laughs> for a character, especially for a character development yeah. like that. Yeah, I I don't feel like he did necessarily uh, as as much as you seem to. Like I think he, he, I felt like they were legitimate teases, lest I wouldn't have uh, included them. Oh yeah, because we don't know exactly how this is going to play out. And oh sure, also sure, these sure. People lie all the time. Yeah, no, that's 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 <laughs> fair, and it's very possible that like the stuff that he said will be uh, coded enough that there's a lot of surprises for her character. But the way she looked, I assumed, I did assume that she was like, "All right, you want me back on on Orion? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you're you're gonna get it, and you're not gonna like it. Like that was me too. And she was, and he did confirm. Yeah, that. and she was embracing it. Um, but yeah. I, 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 uh, it's fine. I'm not like, you know, pissed about it or whatever, but like, I think the, uh, right. I think the, uh, I do. You're not throwing a baby doo doo chin fit. What? 
<laughs> You're not throwing a baby doo-doo chin fit. What? Don't know what that is. Never heard that phrase before. <laughs> it was more for Bethany. Okay. Hey, Bethany. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was for Bethany, too. <laughs> She she referred to someone once as a stupid baby doo doo chin. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. Sorry. I'm uh I'm so as a podcaster, you constantly have to think uh-huh. about how something lands on the ears of the listener, you know? And like I have pod fellow pod Oh god, it's one of those lectures. Not that's in to you. I said the wrong thing. This isn't to you. Uh <laughs> I'm uh, but I do have podcasters I work with that like don't think about that at all. You know, like it's a thing. It's like they say a joke that I have to go like, uh, "What? Explain? <laughs> like you, you didn't set that up? Like you're laughing, <laughs> but like I don't know. But like that you were just you were just you know making a reference to your wife. But it's funny because uh the, that doesn't really bother me. I'm like a lot of times I am the guy who like facilitates the. Uh, explanation, or I try to like make it make sense to the audience. Like that's part of my role. Um, but like, my niece has started to do this around the house. She just likes to walk up to me and say a punchline, it, like something she saw on TikTok, and she just says the punchline without the setup. And she thinks the punchline is funny because she had the setup, but like she, it's not a funny phrase in itself. And I know she, mm-hmm. I know like what she's saying is meant to be funny, but it's not at all. And so I'm triggered by it now. I'm getting, I'm getting to the point where I'm like, because I've just been like telling her for weeks now, like, okay, that's not how humor works. Mm-hmm. You can't just walk into the room and yell chicken, and then like, I don't know what that joke is. Like, I know you're you're talking about a joke you saw earlier, but I don't know what that joke is. <laughs> I don't know, man. Maybe she's a new level of genius. Maybe. Don't stifle the creativity. Maybe so. Maybe she's like the next evolution of Norm Macdonald, no, who just thinks it's hilarious to bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a. Uh, it's the it's the old it's the old uh, balance of like pure creativity versus skill. You know, like when you want to tell a joke. Yeah. You have to understand a joke. It's, it's, it's like that old adage of like, you got to understand the form before you can break it. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you're just like stabbing in the dark. And maybe you hit something genius, but it's just stabbing in the dark. Yeah. Well, who's to say that a true artist needs to show their work like they're in math class? They don't have to show their work. Just just break the shit. Don't, you don't have to prove that you understand the form. Just break it. You don't have to prove it to anybody, but to break it well... <laughs> you have to be able to know the form, I believe. It's just like music. Mm. Music's the same way. Like you gotta like know the rules of tonality so that you can do things that are different than anyone else has ever done. So that you can change them in ways that like both play on the old stuff while doing something completely new. Yep, those are the steps uh, to dying without being recognized for your genius, and then someone figuring out forty years after you're dead that you were a genius. Man, <laughs> critically. Eh. Oh yeah, yeah, that Van Gogh. He was he was actually pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> there's examples yeah. of that in both realms, and of course, there's the <laughs> other side of that, which is like the punk aesthetic, which uh, is I intentionally don't want to learn how to use my instrument and I'm just going to do whatever comes out to sounds good to me. And I don't care what, how it works, you know, but I think most of the best music that comes out of that is from people who did understand. They just took the aesthetic of the punk stuff on. I, I, it's always a personal preference, but like the stuff that I liked that was punk inspired is stuff like, uh, I would love Nirvana. Like it's sort of like sort of post punk stuff that sort of like takes all the elements of pop sensibility and like infuses that sort of punk aesthetic of like we're raw. We don't care if they're exactly in tune. There's all this weirdness happening. It sort of has a punk thing going to it, but it's like it's pop sensible. The tonalities are there. Like they know what they're doing, mm-hmm. even if they don't know exactly why it works. I don't know. I, yeah, there's a mm-hmm. balance to it that, to being like raw and talented yeah. and also knowing what you're doing and yeah. Yeah. 
Dude, Dave, Dave Grohl is one of those guys mm. that, like, when you listen to him talk, he doesn't know how to read or read music. He doesn't know anything. Most rock guys don't know how to read music. He just kind of taught himself shit, yeah. and uh, he plays guitar like he's playing drums in his head mm-hmm. and shit. He, like, I would heavily recommend uh, listening to um, Nora Jones's podcast. Ooh. There's an episode that she did with him where... Uh, and I think she that's what she does on her podcast. She just plays with different musicians. But she's like playing stuff with Dave Grohl and having conversations with him. That's cool. I haven't heard of this podcast. What's it called? Uh, I don't know. Just look up Nora Jones' podcast. I don't remember what it's called. It's called, it's called something. But, uh, yeah, she like the, the whole thing, she's like, oh, yeah, you do this and this like a lot. And he goes, oh, are you going to teach me music? <laughs> <laughs> I've played with a lot of different kinds of musicians and like I Dave Grohl knows rock music. Like he doesn't he doesn't mean he knows classical. Like classical is a different thing and there's like reading music versus yeah. knowing music and like knowing a certain genre. Like he knows rock and roll. Um even if he thinks he like he likes to I think there's some PR there where it's like I don't even, I'm just a little baby picked up an instrument. I don't know. I just, it just comes out. But like that guy sat in his room for years playing guitar and figuring out how to play it well and do it right. And like mimicked, even if you don't learn through like reading. Well, he says he knows cowboy chords. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's all you need, man. It's all you need for a good songwriting. But like he recorded everything on, was it color and shape that he recorded everything on? Uh, no, it was the, uh... Self-titled, maybe? It was Foo Fighters. Okay. Yeah, it was Foo yeah, Fighters. Yeah, the self-titled album. He, he recorded everything on that album. So, like, he clearly... Yeah. ...is not just playing cowboy chords. Like, yeah, you, you're you playing cowboy chords as the har- harmony to write the songs, because that's how pop song rung, songwriting works. But, like, he's still, like, shredding on that album. It's, um... Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Like, he, he knows what he's doing. He just doesn't know what anything's called. Oh, yeah. You don't want to know what anything's called. <laughs> I, I, I've worked with a lot of different guys and these days I tend to hire people who do know what things are called because they're easier to communicate with I don't know what things are called but they can communicate with each other and that makes things much easier I'm yeah. like I'm doing this guys and then somebody goes oh he's playing an A614 blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm like yeah that yeah. sounds good do that <laughs> yeah and that's the funniest thing like especially listening to this podcast like I don't think Dave is faking anything like he's just like oh yeah we kind of do like a oh yeah and she's like oh okay yeah this and he's like yeah 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 all right sure i don't know <laughs> that's what we're doing yeah um it's really neat um uh, yeah i'm definitely gonna check that out funny. that sounds awesome it's called nora john is playing along yeah yeah, yeah and then and yeah. i'm just looking through and i already see a bunch of people that i want to see that i would love to listen to that yeah and uh i did not know about the podcast until i saw dave Grohl was on it and uh and then I was, I listened to that and I was like, okay, well, I think I have a huge crush on Nora Jones. <laughs> well, why wouldn't you? Nora Jones is just like geeking out about Dave Grohl and an incredibly cute, not really like, just kind of adorable, not really uh, leaning into her own proficiency and how big she is. Mm-hmm. You know, like she's starstruck. And that's one of the things that, that's one of the reasons I have a crush on Dave Grohl. Because he's he also is starstruck easily. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I love that. <laughs> like, still got that humility yeah, for sure. You, you you don't want to lose that. Um. Okay. Let's get let's get back to Stu's TV bag. We've been really off the rails this episode. Sorry, guys. How you doing? Sorry, I'm not sorry. You know, this is our podcast. Uh, but I understand that when people come to hear Star Trek and we. Or people are going to hear our response to their feedback or whatever. <laughs> and they yeah. would pause and talk for 20 minutes about Nora Jones and Dave Grohl, which is like nothing to do. But I, I, I'm I, enjoying it. But uh, yeah, uh, I mean, this is the kind of shit I love in podcasts because I will definitely go be like looking stuff up that, that you know, my favorite podcasters are Right. It's about. a balance for me. Like, I obviously this stuff is important to podcasting. Like, the, the rabbit holes you chase are great. And like, Mm-hmm. People that enjoy listening to conversations enjoy listening to conversations, but there's a balance. There's an audience out there for both things, and it's like you got to serve both types of people. So some people are like, oh, man, I, we, I, we, I'm here because I've been listening for three years, and I just like to hear you guys talk, and you guys go on whatever rabbit trail you want. And there's the guy who this is his first podcast, and he's here for Star Trek, and it's like – uh, he, he left an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. So I'm always trying to find that find mm-hmm. that balance, you know? 
What what is that stupid thing that people say? Like, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. That is a thing people say. Yeah, it's dumb. But <laughs> all right, Stu continues. Despite the critiques I had, this was a good finale. I it brought a number of things together from the season, without having to have made the season overly serialized to get there, which is good for me because I like the largely episodic nature of the show. RDM was a great guest star, and at least there was some reference to the the casting. Rutherford's take is correct, since he has superior cyborg visual acuity. (laughs) Tendy's Tendy's leaving is an interesting move, and one I hope actually sticks for a while until being undone. And for the record, Rutherford is just sad because he's missing his platonic friend. (laughs) Okay? Stu is very committed to that bit. I know, and I can't wait. I can't wait for Rutherford to get a little stanky on his hang down <laughs> to make Stu sad. Ugh. Uh, what? You just save. You just that's how they you save the worst phrases for things, and like you love to use those worst phrases. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was very classy. Oh yeah, so classy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, is that that's the last one? That's it. That's all I've got. I swear. Thank you, Steve, for writing in. It was a really we really appreciate you inspiring us to talk about songwriting for a while. And like, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll get out of here. Do you? Uh, when's our next like actually official release? It's like J- January, February, something like that. April. We don't know. Oh, okay. They don't, they haven't I said. You, I thought like, you texted we, me something about it being in April. I said somewhere between January and April. That is not a date. Oh, well, that's, that why, that's why I didn't remember. An estimation. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That is. At best. Discovery. Discovery is likely the next thing. That's. Discovery is going to be the next thing unless you count them re releasing season one of Prodigy on December 25th on Netflix. That'll be a fun thing to drop on Netflix. Like, people. Sit around with their families and like throwing it on, you know. That's that's cool. I dig that. That's a smart move. Yeah, I think it's a great move. Uh, I think uh, the show will get eyes on it that it never did before. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was a little kid. I was at Christmas visiting my aunt and uncle, and that's the first thing of Batman I ever saw. Mm. It was like four or something. Uh, I was very young, very young, yeah. and I remember it was the first time I'd ever gone to my uh, aunt and uncle's for Christmas. Was like, maybe we only went, ever went, they lived in like North Carolina. I think we ever only ever went for Christmas like twice, and uh, one of those times I was like four years old, and the old 66 Batman series uh, was thrown on uh, by my uncle and my dad, who had like watched it as kids or whatever, you know. Um, they threw mm-hmm. it on, and like I, that was my first exposure to Batman. And so it's like that. That this remind that reminds me of like, oh, this is gonna be some kids sitting around Christmas watching Prodigy and like not knowing what those Starfleet symbols mean, but just thinking it's like, oh, this is a cool rock monster with a cute voice, like you know, like and then they're gonna like twenty years from now mm-hmm. have seen everything. You know, I love that. It just made, it warms my heart. Yeah, twenty years from now they're gonna be. Fighting with people on the internet. Yeah. Over Star Trek. It's just. (laughs) (laughs) Letting it tear them apart. You you spend too much time with the online (laughs) fandom, Dave. (laughs) I don't want. You know what? I don't that much anymore. Like, I have. I barely go onto Twitter or anywhere anymore. You just. uh, You just have this vision of, like, all the fans. It's not just me. You remember when we we went to go see uh, Star Trek Insurrection and our friend Ryan? And this was 99, so. No, no big internet here, but uh, Ryan was like, um, "What if I don't like the movie? The Trekkies will eat me." That, like, that's the, not that's not Trekkies had, have been well renowned for no, being hateful. He had nothing. That was nothing to do with uh, Ryan thinking Trekkies were hateful. I don't think that had something to do with Ryan feeling out of place. Like he's going oh, to a place. Sure. You could have said the same thing about like. Uh, uh, what if I do something wrong in this church? They're going to eat me. Or what if I do something wrong in this, uh, whatever, I- any, any environment? Like, of course, they have their own reputation. You're right. Um, Star Trek is a religion <laughs> and a cult. Yeah, exactly. Um, but no, I, th- I think that mostly just anyone going into a thing they're not used to <laughs> and have expectations of like a feeling like they're part of the out group, you know? Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, no, I it does it, it does bug me specifically. Uh, watching people attack each other over yeah. stuff that we're all supposed to, that we're supposed to. Yeah, enjoy. I guess that's a, a and like I know you enjoy at least you used to. I don't know. Maybe maybe you said you do it less now. Uh, I know you enjoy getting online and chatting about Star Trek and being part of those communities. You've made friends that way over the years. Um, yeah, I, I, when you're I younger. have a few. Yeah, I have a few friends that way, but I don't now. I I do like talking to them, but they agree with me that yeah. you know attacking someone for not liking a thing or liking a thing is. Stupid. I think it's most. I think it's v- much more fans like that that you're talking about. Uh, it's just the ones that like to attack are the ones that are loudest because they're attacking. I think most people are just sitting and enjoying the thing, and like that's why. Mm. I, yeah, you know. I hope. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's more I think it's I think it's slanted in that direction. I really do. But I also also think that uh you know there there needs to be a certain amount of uh admonishment, I guess, of, of that kind of shitty behavior so less people come up thinking like, Oh yeah, that's what I'll do. That'll be cool. I'll get all you know, be hateful to people. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, uh, I hear that, and I and I do. I admonish it. Uh, I I want everybody to know if you're an asshole like that, I think you're a piece of shit, and I'm gonna block you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hear that. Sorry. Uh, no, nothing to apologize for. Well, guys, we have gone. Really long for this episode. I didn't expect it to be very short. We did. We had it covered a lot of Star Trek, and I like it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what made us go so long. Yeah. Uh, but guys, we'll be back soon with lots more to talk about. And uh, we uh, we love you very much. Jolan True. Live long. Prosper. All the things. All of them. My, my right titty hurts. Ooh. I'm sorry, bud. Is it is yeah. it shaped like an inverted Starfleet symbol? <laughs> Why would it be? I don't know. <laughs> no, explain your joke. It was funny, but I need to understand it more. I don't know. That feels like a man boob shape, general man boob shape. You know, whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> swoop oh, down, swoop up. I you know, see. an upside down, yeah, inverted, not really inverted. For some reason, like I thought, like. Like inverted, like it was instead of like being like, like, like the, a, a Starfleet symbol, but like it was going inside, oh. like there's like a like a branding or no, something. I no, don't know. I gotcha. No, I just meant like man boob <laughs> happens. To, yeah, I meant in the way that there are Starfleet symbols everywhere you look. Really, <laughs> yeah, there are. My dick is a Starfleet symbol. Uh, that sounds more like a medical issue. <laughs> it hurts so bad, Matt. <laughs> Again, that one's for Bethany. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 